I think we're live here. We should be, yeah. Um, for for once, the video didn't work the way it should have. <laughs> you want me to click on it and see if it works? Yeah, would you mind? Which one is it? Is it the third one, the it's, most recent? No, it's the one that says 5.0. Uh, they're really small in the video clips. Um, Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning and good evening, as Dan says. Uh, welcome to Journey to the Cloud 5.0. And this is our fifth event in the series of Journey to the Cloud. We have some fantastic guests tonight. Uh, we have Joseph, we have Dan, we have Frank, we have Aaron Dan, uh, we've Dominic, Dominic and we've Solomon joining us uh, for Journey to Cloud 5.0. Welcome, everyone. Hey, everyone. Thank you, Matt. Hi, everyone. How are we all this evening? How, how is everyone this evening? Very good. Good. I'm also good. Good. Excellent. That's 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 good to hear um okay so uh tonight we're going to have a few presentations um we are going to start with uh we're going to start with aaron dan uh aaron, if you want to take the uh if you want to take the floor and share your presentation um anyone else that wants to mute their mic or camera can do um off you go Aaron. okay so let me share my screen. So you guys can see my screen? Yes, yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. So um, uh, my topic today is uh, uh, Power of DevOps you know, CLI and REST API. Uh, a little bit about myself, you know, my name is Arundam Mitra and uh, I am an Azure uh, Cloud uh, and DevOps architect. Uh, over having 16 years of experience, uh, mostly in cloud for five years now. Uh, you can look in me into LinkedIn, uh, GitHub, uh, Dev Community, uh, Sessionize, where you have everything. All my, all my articles published. And um, I haven't prepared a um, the whole presentation only because you know uh, this this whole demo I mean this whole topic is is much cooler if you if you see live rather than if I if I put it in PowerPoint presentation and that is why I have kept it very very discreet and I will quickly jump into the demo so that you can experience that uh, what I actually mean when I say that uh, the power of DevOps CLI and REST API okay so. Uh, on that note, um, here you see that this is my this is my DevOps organization. So when this is my DevOps organization, then uh, the first thing about whole DevOps thing is uh, we need it because uh, we need to do the CI/CD part, which means that continuous integration and continuous deployment. 
and this is this is the automation part and you can use powershell you can use uh, you can use terraform but in order to do that the first thing that you need is a devops organization and then a devops project so this is my devops organization and then you see that you know i have like a demo arundam mitra as a project so this is a private project but when we when uh, when we are creating this project so it might happen that uh, that in an organization uh, there might be like multiple projects uh, and every project will demand a devops project because they have their application code they have their infrastructure code and they want to keep it into they want to segregate it by devops project so it can be like you know one organization and then you can have multiple devops project uh, depending upon how many project is running in your organization but when you are deploying this devops project it it also needs some kind of a best practices so first thing is that uh, when you are starting a project and when you are starting that project in a sense that you want to automate it the first thing you require is a devops project but once you have a devops project then probably you need repositories because here you are going to uh, push your code and you, this is where you are going to version control it now once you have this code then probably you will have every every repository has a, has a main branch and when the main branch is there it also has branch policies um, and these are the branch policies like you know there is a minimum number of reviewers there's like when you are doing a pull request that pull request has to be associated with the work item then when you are doing a code review so uh, you did a code review and then you added a comment in the in the code review and Till the time the developer or the DevOps engineer has resolved that comment, you know, you cannot merge the pull request from your feature branch to your main branch. Uh, there are like, you know, how many merge types are there? How many merge type you want to allow in your project? Uh, what about the reviewers? Okay, like, you know, I have, I have four or five reviewers. So instead of adding it, like, you know, uh, uh, by one by one, maybe I associate a Azure Active Directory group. This is something these are like one of the best practices uh, in the repository which you can do then if i come to the pipeline part um, you need you need to have environment because if you don't have environment then you cannot have the approval gate the approval gate is is something like you know you're releasing a code and and you're deploying something in azure but uh, there has to be an approver who approves it only when then you can uh, you can deploy in azure but in order to do that you have to have an environment. Similarly, like, you know, uh, pipelines. Here in the pipelines, it can happen that uh, application is also running their pipelines uh, and infrastructure is also uh, running the pipelines. And when you start seeing that, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a huge list. And then you cannot bifurcate that, okay, which is the infrastructure pipelines, which are application pipelines. So you need to have a bifurcation in terms of folder, like infrastructure has a folder, application has a folder, maybe database has a folder, and then you know you have segregated again into subfolders. Okay, infrastructure. Okay, I deploy resource group. So resource group a folder. I deploy an app service. There's app service. So then it it looks much neater. So this is again something you know which is uh, which is very much required. Um, then every project also needs agent pools agent pools are nothing but these are like vms virtual machines either those are microsoft hosted virtual machines or it is uh, it is like a self hosted agent like you have vms in data center and then there's those uh, vms are then associated as an agent pool and, the, and these vms are basically the base infrastructure on which your pipelines are running executing executing all the tasks which is mentioned in your pipeline and after that execution everything is seen in the azure portal so so if like for example now all the things which i mentioned if you have to do on a daily basis repeatedly same thing over and over again it becomes really cumbersome it becomes really really tedious and this is what uh, uh, this is what and i have built a pipeline this can be done in various ways it can be done with PowerShell, it can be done with DevOps CLI, it can be done with REST API, it can be done with Terraform. But I thought that, you know, okay, you know, why not to give uh, the whole Microsoft native tooling rather than a third-party tooling like uh, Terraform. 
So I, I started exploring with DevOps CLI. I started exploring with REST API because why I use REST API is very simple that, you know, few of the configurations are not supported by DevOps CLI. And then what I did is I used REST API and then I merged the REST API with DevOps CLI to, to make the automation run. Now, here you see that I have already have a published blog out here. Uh, this is like stating everything. And this is what my pipeline is doing. So my first, my pipeline is actually installing the DevOps CLI extension. And then after that, you know, and this DevOps CLI extension is required in the build agent to, to run the CLI commands. And then I'm verifying it by running a help command in the DevOps CLI. Then it is displaying the PAC token. And this PAC token, you will see in the demo itself that this PAC token is actually provided in the runtime because without this PAC token, PAT is again, the full form is personal access token. And without this PAT, you know, you cannot create a DevOps project. And then finally you create a DevOps project. Now, once you create a DevOps project, then you are making it as a default configuration. Like, you know, when you're running it, you always don't have to uh, mention the DevOps uh, organization URL or the project name. So you're making it a default, uh, you know, you're setting it as a default. And then you are creating repositories. Then you're initializing the repositories, creating pipeline folders. Then again, pipeline environment, which I, I mentioned about the environment because this, this is where you're going to put the approval gate. Then you are creating the agent pools. And these are all the main branch policies which I'm setting, you know, minimum number of reviewers and kind of things. So this whole thing, you know, you can do a lot of lot more things, but you know, I was exploring and I, I thought that, you know, these are the bare minimum things which every DevOps engineer should be doing uh, when they are provisioning a DevOps project for any of the application, uh, you know, projects or anything. So uh, this is the bare minimum thing, but of course you can do multiple more things with CLI and, and REST API, even with Terraform, there are a lot of providers coming up, but uh, this is the, I, I feel that every project, uh, no matter how small or how large it is, it should have these basic settings. Now, all these things, you know, all, all the settings which I said, I have put together in a code, and this is the code out here in the Git repository. Now let's let's little bit see the code and then I will come back to and, and run the pipeline and show you that how it works. Okay. Now in my pipeline, what I have done is the trigger. Trigger part is the most important part. It means that I have put it as none. It means that you can you can put it as main or you can put it as a feature branch, which means that okay, that whenever like you know somebody is committing from the feature branch, uh, uh, then this pipeline will automatically start or if somebody is committing directly into the master branch or main branch, then this pipeline will automatically start, but I don't want in that way. So I put it as none. Now then I declared as a parameter. So this is, this whole section is, is a parameter section. What does it mean? It means that these are runtime parameters. So these are the fields which you will see in the GUI of the pipeline when you're going to run. So when you trigger the pipeline, it will give you all these options. It will ask you for the PAC token. It will show you the DevOps organization URL. It will ask you for the DevOps project. And this, is, this will also ask you the DevOps description. So you're making it more dynamic in sense that you're giving the user flexibility. Okay, what project name you want to keep? What is the, is the test project? And also you are asking the user to provide the PAC token. Now this PAC is very, very powerful. If like, you know, this can be, if somebody has it, he can, he can create multiple projects. That is why whenever you are generating PAT, it has two things has to be kept in mind that we are not going to keep it in keyword because again, uh, uh, it can be viewed again uh, by, by people who has access, even list and get is also dangerous in this part. And whenever you're gener I mean, generating PAT, it has to be short lived which means that you are generating a pad for maybe two days, or even if you are generating for a month, then as soon as the job is done, you expire the pad token so that it is, you're maintaining a little bit of security boundaries and your, your security officer is not questioning. So, I mean, like, you know, if, if anybody from my team is running this code, okay, you know, 
the first thing they have to ask is, okay, can you can I have the PAD token? I give the PAD token, they run it, I expire the token. So that is how the flexibility and keeping it. Then is the second the second part is the is the declare variables part. So these are the variables which any user can change. If some, for example, like Matthew is running this code and he feels that okay, I will I will change the environment from dev to non-prod or maybe to pre-prod. So you can change it. Uh, uh, maybe Dan doesn't like AM pool zero one. He will put as Dan pool zero one. Uh, I mean, like you know, the user, the email ID, everything. So the way this whole pipeline has been designed is that only by changing this section and by changing this section, that is all you need. The rest, even if you don't understand, it will still work. Even if you change these values. So this is this is the dynamic part of the whole. Uh, uh, of the whole provisioning of the DevOps project. Now then I declared the build agent. So the build agent here is the, uh, I have taken the Ubuntu latest. It means that I'm using the Microsoft hosted agent. It is again a dummy VM where on, on the top of which your, uh, your, your pipeline is running. Then I declared a stage. So it's a single stage pipeline because I don't have a multi, I don't require a multi-stage. So I kept a single stage pipeline. And then the first thing, you know, which I'm doing based on this whole uh, documentation or the blog which I have written, the first thing which I'm doing is like, I am creating a DevOps project. So this is what, I'm oh, sorry, I am, I'm actually installing a CLI uh, extension. So this is, this is the CLI extension feed or the code snippet, which is doing that. Then the next stage is that, okay, CLI extension is done, but I have to validate whether the extension has been installed properly. So I'm just running a help command, you know, AZ DevOps hyphen H, just to check that, okay, CLI has, it's, 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 it's like, you know, installed properly. Then what I'm doing is that, you know, I'm making sure that the path which I'm running or which I am uh, providing during the runtime, is that path correctly accepted by the build agent? And that is why I'm displaying the path. This is again, not necessary, but I have like, you know, when I was testing the whole code, I was just putting every block of or piece of code so that, you know, there's no, there's very, very minimal chance of failing. So that is why I displayed the path. Then I moved to creating the DevOps project. So this is, this is where I'm creating the DevOps project. So uh, when, I mean, like, you know, you can see that, you know, I'm taking, I have taken the name from the, from the runtime parameter. I'm taking the description from the runtime parameter. I'm taking the organization details from the, uh, from the runtime parameters. So everything is like, you know, dynamic. Either I'm taking from the runtime parameters or I'm taking from the variables, but there is nothing hard coded. Then I am setting it as a default. Again, you know, using parameters and, and, and variables. Then what I'm doing is I'm creating repositories. So one thing to note is whenever you are creating, for example, I'm creating a DevOps project called Dan. So I created a project called Dan. So as soon as I provision a DevOps project called Dan, it automatically also creates one default repository by the name of Dan. So that is why what I did was I additionally created another two repositories. So here, what I did is like I used, I am I'm just doing everything dynamic. So I took the DevOps name from the parameter and I just appended hyphen infrastructure and hyphen application. You can change it to anything. It, it doesn't matter. Just, just for the, uh, for, for example purposes, I, I took it. So, if my DevOps project name is Dan, so it means Dan hyphen infrastructure, Dan hyphen application. If my DevOps project is Matthew, Matthew hyphen infrastructure, Matthew hyphen application. That is how it's, it's going to create the repository. Now, once the repository is created, then you have to also initialize the repository. What do you mean by initializing the repository? It means that you know you have to you have to make it available so that you can put the required files and uh, uh, you can start using it. You, know, you can start uh, placing the code uh, and you know version control it. So you have to initialize it. And this is where, uh, this is the code. So the first part, this one, this whole configuration is required uh, before you can initialize any of the repository. So you have to set the username, you have to set the email addresses, you have to make sure that, that when, whenever we are initializing the repository, uh, it means that we are targeting the main branch and nothing else. 
And then, you know, we have to make sure that we are resetting the HTTPS proxy. Otherwise, it will not be able to resolve the entire URL with, with the Git appending it. So it will, it will fail. So that is why we have to set this whole configuration first. And once we have done this, then I'm just putting small text that repo name is like, you know, I'm taking it from the runtime parameter and I'm, I'm, I'm redirecting it to readme.md file. And then I'm just committing it. I'm just, you know, first adding it, committing it and pushing it. And I did entirely for all the repositories. Out here. Then is the next step, which is like creating the five pipeline folder. Now this pipeline folder, which I'm creating is again, you know, uh, again using, uh, I'm using the PowerShell task and I'm creating the pipeline folder where it is, it is like, you know, making sure that, you know, I have repositories like application and I have repository like infrastructure. So based on that, I have also created pipeline folder like application and infrastructure. And then I'm creating the environment. Now here in these two sections, when I'm creating the environment and when I'm creating the agent pool, these two, why I'm using REST API, because these are not being supported by DevOps, DevOps CLI. I, I, I had a look into the whole documentation. I will show you later, but uh, that's not possible. And that is why I use REST API. It's very simple. Uh, what I did is like, you know, I'm using, when I say REST API, it's like, you know, you, you have to, you have to send it by, you know, uh, with the whole, you have to invoke it and uh, you have to have it in a JSON format. This is what I did. So the environment name, I'm taking it from the uh, from the variable, and then I'm, I'm I'm putting it in the JSON format. So this is the JSON format. And when I'm doing this whole thing, you know, uh, then I'm putting it using Azure Dev DevOps Invoke. So when you, I mean, like if you want to use it in the in the, in a PowerShell way. And you want to use REST API, you have to integrate it with Azure DevOps invoke commandlet. And this is what I did for environment. And it's a similar process for, uh, this is a similar process for creating the agent pool. How I came into this, uh, how I concluded that, you know, I have to do it in this way. There's a very good documentation uh, available uh, in Microsoft. You see that here it's the DevOps CLI and here is the DevOps uh, REST API. So everything is available. You just have to read it and kind of, uh, you have to do it. And how I'm using the REST API and how did I uh, conclude that, okay, I have to put it in this format, this, this I read from here. You see that if I have to add an environment, the request body says that I have to put name and then I have to put description. And when you have to add uh, something, uh, Using REST API, it is always post. And when you want to fetch something, like you want to list down something, it has to be get. So I'm using the post. This URL doesn't change because you know this has been provided by Microsoft. All changes is the organization and the project. I use this whole thing. So in my case, this is this part, which is dev.azure.com, it's common. It's generic, it doesn't change, it will never change. So I kept it that. The organization name, it is coming from my runtime parameter. The project name coming from runtime parameter. And these all are all predefined standard from Microsoft, which will never change. So I, I, I just used it. I just made it parameterized. I, I, I used this whole format, put it in the JSON body, and then I fired the command using Azure DevOps invoke command, which I, which I explained it here. And then finally, I'm putting it everything, I'm, I'm putting all the branch policies in place. This is the minimum number of reviewers. If you are doing a pull request, that should be associated with a, a work item in Azure DevOps board. Uh, if you are doing a code review, then and then uh, if like, you know, if I'm the reviewer and I have put a comment that, okay, this is not, this naming, this naming convention is, is, is not correct. And so before he does a pull request from his feature to main branch, he has to make sure that he makes the correction, he resolves the command only, he will be allowed to merge from feature to master. And finally, is the, is the, like the, uh, the code reviewers and says that who are allowed to actually approve the code or approve the pull request. So this is, this is all about the code. 
And now we see in reality that how it, how it works. So I go to my organization and this is my repository. And here I have put all my out here. These, this is my trial, trial things. And this is where you, know, you see that the code is there, which is already published. And now I go to the pipeline. Even when I'm doing in my in my own test environment, I try to keep the best practices. And you see that all the things which I'm testing uh, to publish in my blogs, I've kept it in a in the particular folder. And you see that there is an AZ DevOps CLI folder. So I click on this one. And now I, I go here and I simply run the pipeline. When I run the pipeline, you see that I'm getting all those uh, runtime variables here. I need a pat. The DevOps organization is pre-populated. The project name is pre-populated. Description is pre-populated, but there is no pat token, which means that even if you have the code, if you cannot run because you don't have the pat token. Now, I have already have a pat token generated, so I will just copy this and I will put it here. And what I will do is I will just change it to AM, not AM01, but maybe AM0010. And this, I will just make it run. So now, this is all going to set up everything. So now, since I'm running it in the Microsoft hosted agent, it might take in a few seconds to, to invoke the pipeline. And we see that, you know, everything which, is, which was written in the code, it will start, you know, executing one by one. Okay, I'm glad it worked. Um, now you see that, let's let's focus on uh, each and everything. So you see that I have now the CLI, Azure CLI installed and I have all the, everything installed out here and this is the version of the CLI which got installed. Now I did, uh, I did, I, I displayed the pad token out here, okay. So this is, uh, sorry, this is the CLI help uh, which I, I fired. So it is showing me that, you know, what a AZ DevOps CLI can do. Then I displayed the pack token. You see, this is a pack token which got displayed. Then I created the DevOps project and I'm, 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 I'm displaying it as a table. So you see that I am like AM0010 is a private DevOps project with the Agile and a Git source control. Then I set it as default. Then I created repositories. So you see that I have an, an AM0010 infrastructure and then I have an application. Then I initialized all the repositories. These are the pipeline folders which got created, infrastructure and application. Then I created the environment. Then I created the agent pool and then the rest of the things. Now, how it looks in the DevOps GUI. You see, earlier I had AM Cloud and Arundam Mitra, and now we have AM0010. So this DevOps project got created. So this is one task. Now, the second task, I get into this, I go here, I see the repos, okay. So this is the default repo, which I mentioned that you know, when it, one, one repo gets created by the name of the DevOps project itself. Now let's see if they have created another one. Okay, application and infrastructure got created. But you see that, in every uh, in every repository, you will see a readme.md file, and if you go here, you see that I've just just put a small test uh, mentioning the repo name itself. If I go in application, 
Uh, if I click on readme file, if I go to preview, you see the same name which I have uh, fetched from the from the repository name. If I go to the infrastructure, again readme, it's again. So this is how I, I created the repo and then I initialized the repo. So this is this is again, this is again. So so we created the project, we created the repository, we initialized the repository. Now we look into pipeline folders. Okay. Let's go to pipeline. And here you see I have created two folders, application and infrastructure. Okay, so this is also done. Now, what about pipeline environment? Okay, let's go. So I go to environment and you see there's a dev environment. I have created a dev environment, cool. Then I go to agent pool. Okay, so I go here in project settings. I go here as service connection, I'm sorry, uh, agent pool. And you see that I have created this AM pool 001, which got created, okay. Cool. Now I go here and I see that you know, all these all these uh, minimum number of reviewers, check link, and every, every possible uh, policies which I have created against the main branch. So let's review that. Now I go to the repository. Once I go to the repository, I go to the branches. Now I, when I go to the branches, so in the repository itself, First of all, like, you know, I have three repository, which means that each repository has its own main branch. If I go to this repository and then I click on this one, you see that there is there is one main branch. Now, if I go here uh, in the application repository, it will also have a main branch. And if I, if I go to the infrastructure, it will again have the same similar main branch, which means that when I have to set that whole policies for the main branch, it means that I have to set that policy three times because I have three different repository and each repository has a main branch. So I will first start with this one, the default repository which got created. Now I go to branches, you see the main branch, go to the extreme right, three dots, click on it, you go to the branch policy. When you go to the branch policy, you see all the settings which I have done. So I have put minimum number of reviews as two. I have also selected that, you know, how it should react or what the policy should be doing when a new changes are being pushed. What should be the, what should be the action, you know, uh, regarding if I, if I want to check for link work items, it is required. I've put it required as not as optional. Also for common resolution, I've put it as required and not as optional. And finally, I know when I, I put as a uh, limit merge type, merge type in sense like, you know, you have a feature branch and then you have a main branch. And how do you want to do the the uh, the merge or the pull request? Uh, normally, you know, how you do it is that in the feature branch, you, uh, you do, um, uh, I mean, like you do a lot of commit and kind of thing, you know, you don't maintain the commit history. Uh, it's too shabby because, you know, you are constantly coding or shooting and, and doing and then when you're doing the merge, you don't want to keep it. So, uh, so it depends upon what kind of a commit you want to do and you know how, how, uh, how your infrastructure as a code or application code would require. So either it's like, you know, one or two enable or you can enable everything. So I enabled everything as a part of the policy. And then finally, I have put, uh, uh, put as a review and I have just added myself as a required reviewer, which means that every time there is a there is a code review required or merge required, pull request required, every time you know they will ask me for the whole approval thing. So for AM01, again, if I go back here, if I go to application repository, if I go to the main branch, it will be exactly the same policy. Finally, if I if I go to the infrastructure. And if I go to the main branch again, you will see that again it's all the same. So it means that you know, um, if if in an organization, if uh, if any time they need a DevOps project, I always want to manually create them again one by one, create everything instead of that. You know, maybe I just run the command. You know, like five times a day, ten times a day. It doesn't matter because it just takes two to three minutes uh, in the whole execution and. Uh, it, it, it creates everything. Things I want to highlight 
uh, is like you know the code and the uh, and the entire process how I create it is mentioned in my blog. Uh, I have tried to explain every code snippet one by one. So this is the code code block which is here in the blog as well and in the Git repo. I've also tried to put together a screenshot where how the runtime variable looks like. Um, then I have tried to explain that uh, these variables are like, you know, these are uh, these are dynamics and you, know, you can change it and uh, these can be done. Then the pipeline result, how it looks like. So all particular details regarding, uh, uh, regarding how the pipeline execution is done is mentioned here. I've also tried to explain that why I have added these, these block of things. And if you don't add, what is the kind of error you are getting? So this is also I have tried to explain. So if you're not adding those usernames, email, uh, initialization for the main branch, you know, uh, if you see it uh, in, the, in the screenshot, you know, it, it doesn't allow you to proceed. If you are if you're not resetting the HTTPS proxy, it is not able to resolve the host. If you are not if you are not using the the git push command, then then you are encountering that you know uh, it's not able to read the username. So these were a lot of experience which I gained when I was doing one by one. I was trying to execute because uh, remember that everything is happening in the build agent. So your code has to be uh, dynamic enough to understand that okay it is happening in the build agent and that build agent is somewhere sitting in Microsoft data center or maybe somewhere sitting in the uh, in the in, in your data center maybe you have uh, an RDP access or maybe an SSA access maybe you don't have it and you have to amend your code in a way so that you know it uh, it is pragmatic enough to uh, balance out all the scenarios so that your pipeline execution is correct and finally, uh, the pipeline folder creation um, uh, regarding here, I have also mentioned how and where, uh, I mean, like how you have to browse, where you have to go uh, to find the, the REST API links for adding the pipeline environment and the uh, agent. And uh, this is a code snippet for everything. So have a read of this blog and go through this, run the code. I'm pretty sure that it is going to run. I'm again, finally going to show you the final uh, run of the uh, the run history once again so that you know uh, okay if I go here so this is this is how you know every time you run you like if I if I for example this is what I was trying you cannot identify so there are like a lot of pipelines if I'm not making it a folder it's very difficult for anybody in the operation real-time operation to handle that okay which is my pipeline and here in the folder, I just browse the folder. I go here, I see the history. This is my latest run. And this will exactly tell you how much time it took. You see that it, the whole DevOps project creation, including putting it as a best practice, it just took me one minute, four seconds. So imagine that, you know, if I have to create 10 different projects, just, you know, maybe a little bit of tweaking, maybe changing the names here and there, maybe it will take me one minute. And you know my execution is going to take me two minutes, and three minutes, and everything. And think about how much time it will take. You know, if you have to do every time the same, same repetitive process. Uh, that's that's all from my side. Uh, you, I mean, like again, just to mention, uh, this is this is the link of my blog. I'll post it again. This is the repository. Uh, it's a public repository, so you can fork it, you can clone it. And regarding the REST API and CLI, a visit to the Microsoft documentation, they have documented really well. Uh, uh, this, is the, this is the whole REST API documentation. The most important part in order to understand the REST API, my suggestion before you put it into DevOps and uh, how to use it is use Postman. I would have loved to show you uh, someday, you know, maybe I'll write a blog on that. But uh, I mean, like using, I mean, if you want to really play with REST API, I would suggest that you should have hands on on Postman first, because Postman is more like, you know, feeding details and then, you know, uh, triggering the API call. It's, it's more of a manual way because that way you will understand how the REST API is actually working. And that, that will give you a better understanding it, embedding it into Azure DevOps pipeline to use it further into automation. 
So uh, yeah, that is that is all from my side. Um, finally, I you know just to just before I take any questions, uh, I just wanted to just wanted to thank Matthew and and Dan for providing me the opportunity in this uh, channel uh, and in the journey to the cloud uh, forum to present my work. Thank you so much. Thank that was you awesome. So much, Aaron Dan. Um, uh, obviously, um, uh, my name is Matthew. So uh, I, myself and Dan started this group of engineers and IT administrators and DevOps, and it's just grown, um, is the only word for it. It's it's grown so much. Um, Aaron, Dan, that was by far one of the best presentations I've actually ever watched on Azure Pipelines. Um, I'm looking forward to having you on our sessions more. Um, you you have been a regular contributor, and uh, obviously, Aaron uh, Aaron Dam is going to be one of the engineers that's going to be welcome onto the most valuable contributor section of my website, where Thank we're going so to much. feature uh, engineers that get involved in our journey to the cloud. Aaron Dam is quite talented, as we can see, and I'm I'm delighted you could join us this evening, Aaron Dam. Really really appreciate that thank you so thank much. you thank you so much matthew you know for inviting me showing my work dan thank you so much for promoting me uh and uh, uh so i mean like i just want to call it out loud that i started my whole speaker session with uh, with asa and with dan and with you matthew and i will always always try to be in your forum present my work whenever whenever it is possible thank you so much Amazing, amazing. Really um, okay. okay, so we have Frank Falvey next uh, delivering a presentation on uh, AZ900, the Microsoft Fundamentals Azure exam for all those beginners starting out. No more than me, no more than Dan, Solomon, and um, we all started somewhere. And I and I think most of us have uh, have looked at the AZ900 and it is it's a building block to what is an amazing career in Azure um, once you start getting stuck into it and learning it and actually using it in real live environments. Uh, Frank, the floor is yours. Uh, I will turn on the presentation. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Frank, you're up next. Been in the technology space for over 20 years, mostly data storage business, Dell and EMC. Um, so I'll just get on to the next screen there. So this evening, I'm going to go through the Azure Fundamentals number AZ900. This is just an overview. Um, I'm not going to go through the whole course, obviously, it'll take too long. But um, it will kind of give you an overview of everything you need to know for the Azure Fundamentals. So here, it's um, broke up into six areas. Um, I'm not going to read out everything now because we were here all night. But um, just to give you an idea, like, you know, cloud concepts there is kind of broken down into 20 or 25 sent and for the exam part they kind of require you to have to get 700 out of a thousand and um, so when you're looking at this waiting thing somebody might get 40 questions somebody else might get 45 so that's why they have the two different things there like that so it's as they say it's broke up into six different sections so I'm just going to the next one there. So module one is kind of broke up into, is broke down in, into different areas. So we've got the cloud modules there, like public, private, hybrid, and then it kind of goes then into the benefits and considerations. And then you've got your cloud services, your IS, your PaaS, and your SaaS. Um, I'll explain a little bit more as we go on these kind of things here now, like 
there is your public cloud. So the public cloud is basically Azure is the public cloud and the private one then is your in-house one. And hybrid is a mixture of the top two. So, so these are some of the benefits of cloud compute, uh, the cloud. Obviously, high availability, scalability, and that's secure, uh, security, agility, just to name a few of them. Um, so this is the other part of it then. Instead of spending a lot of money up front, you know, your capital expenditure, the, the public cloud gives you the, the OPEX, where you can just, just pay for what you use, like, like the capital one, you don't have to go out and spend thousands of dollars and you, whereas you can just go away and spin up something and pay as you go, as you can see in the bottom one there. So these are the kind of DIS, PaaS and SaaS kind of broke up into different, in the, the green part is the part that you actually manage yourself. Like you can see there on the left, the on-premises stuff is belong to you. Um, so you look after all that yourself. That's the stuff your, your, your capital expenditures after buying all this. So you have to look after that yourself. Um, I think I lost the screen there, yeah. So then the other, the other part then is the blue part. That's the part like that Microsoft looks after all that stuff. Like so, um, the software as a service. An example of that one is probably your email. You know, the only thing you do is you send data and you access it and stuff like that. Everything else under the hood, Microsoft looks after that. So that's a kind of a, an example of that shared responsibility. So then on to model, module two, this is kind of focuses kind of on the, the architecture kind of components, like where your data centers in are and where your resource groups and all this kind of stuff and um, core resources like compute network storage and databases. So, so these are kind of, the architectural components of like regions, zones, resources, resource groups, and um, subscriptions. So we kind of drill down into those a little bit. So like here is kind of the, the map really of all the, the Azure regions. Um, there's some government ones as well. I can't see on the screen now, but um there is one in china one in america as far as i know but these are changing all the time and um, there's new ones being developed all the time so you can see there's a big cluster of them there in europe and um, i'm from ireland so our one there is called northern europe and yes yeah, so that's kind of where um, all the data centers are in the world. So next one, um, I think, yeah. So this gives you a rough idea of the resource groups. So you can have everything in one group there up in the top section, it kind of gives you, you know, you can have your databases, your VMs, your storage, all in one group if you want. Or else you can keep them all separate, keep all your web stuff and database in one group, or you can keep all your VMs in another group. And the same for storage. It's up to yourself really what way you can you can use your resource groups. So this is the subscription then. So the main account is the main person, so they can actually give out um, different kind of um, budgets or different departments or wherever, whatever way you want to kind of break them down, you know? And they could generate different bills for different departments and for like that, so. And 
obviously the main administrator would kind of have access to who gets what and it's up to yourself what way you kind of you can see there's kind of done in a hierarchical structure kind of billing accounts billing profiles down to invoices then so that's a, give you a rough idea what the subscriptions are so the next one then is um core workloads that's like your your vms your networking your storage you can see all the different types of storage in there blobs disk storage file storage um and then all your different all the different databases there like the cosmo db and azure databases wherever and all these can be found on the, the azure marketplace there's actually tons of stuff this is only kind of an example of some of them so moving on then to module three so there's uh, core solutions so like you've got your internet of things to azure sphere down to your data analytics stuff and ai and machine learning so there's quite a lot of stuff in there um, the Azure management tools then, right? So you can go straight into the portal or if you're good at PowerShell, you can use that or uh, CLA. And you saw that in the previous one there. Um, so then you got your Azure Advisor, Azure Monitor and Service Health. They're all the kind of uh, management tools. So these are the solutions there. I said they're Internet of Things. Um, so there's a lot of kind of stuff inside, you know, when you drill down into the Internet of Things, that's kind of a um, good example of the Internet of Things. There's, you know, the ring doorbell where you can see somebody at your front door. Well, that uses the Internet of Things. And the next space then is kind of your data analytics stuff again, your machine learning, serverless. So good luck there in the solutions. Um, so these are kind of showing you again, the management tools, how you can actually interact with the, the Azure cloud. Um, some people have their favorites. Um, you know, people love just going into the portal and hate CLA. <laughs> um, but uh, I think you kind of need to touch on a lot of it. As far as I know, there's not much questions on the PowerShell, but there is PowerShell questions in the the Azure admin, as far as I know. So next one. So we're on to module four there just to show you kind of the Azure security features there, Defender for the cloud, and you've got your Azure key vault there for holding your credentials. Um, then the, the network security, um, I'll show you a bit of that as we go forward. Um, network security groups and firewalls, denial of service protection. And as you can see there again, like um, Microsoft Defender for the Cloud, that's including all the different policies and stuff like that and gives you security alerts. And um, the big one there is Microsoft Sentinel. That's the security, big security part in the cloud. Um, key Vault there again for holding your credentials and dedicated hosts. Um, so yeah, you can kind of see the security there, the way it is kind of um, set up into all different layers. So, you know, before you can get down to your data, there's a lot of layers actually to go through, you know, firewalls and network security groups and so on. So moving on to module five, and um, this is kind of the part where you've got your identities and service, Active Directory, multi-factor authentication, all your controls, um, Azure governance, like for role-based access control, 
um, policies. Um, tags, tags are a handy one for, especially for and naming kind of resources and for budgeting and things like that. Um, so yeah, so the privacy and compliance part as well, that's, you know, the trust center. Um, let me just move on there. More of a breakdown there of the identity service. Like it explains the difference between authentication and authorization. Um, defines the Azure Active Directory, um, describes the functionality of using the Active Directory, and again, the authentication there, like the multi factor one, you know, where if you log on to something there and they send you a message to your phone, so they want to know it is you, you know, very, very good. Um, so yeah, you can see kind of there the, the governance part and again in the, the picture kind of gives you an example like of the user um, sends a signal, the Active Directory wants to know who the person is and they could send you a message back to your phone just to, to, to make sure it is you like so. There's the role base access again. You see that all the time is being mentioned or back. So that's what it stands for role base access. And next one. So this is module six. So as I said, there's six modules. This is the final one. And um, it's kind of like all about managing your costs and stuff like that. So um you hear people there spinning up VMs and they forget to spin them back down and next they get a big bill at the end of the month and they say, oh, I forgot that. And make sure credit card is after being hit. Um, so yeah, the cost management is a big thing like so. Um, so this service le level agreement and life cycles, you know, that's the kind of thing like that they can gar guarantee you that if you put something up in the cloud, they'll, they'll guarantee you kind of 99.9% .9 that it'll be there all the time. So that's kind of that sort of stuff. Um, so as I was saying again about um, planning and costs, um, identif like before you kind of do anything with the cloud and whatever like that, you should have a kind of a strategy really kind of not just dump something up there and leave it like so, you know, you want to identify what you can do and how much it's going to cost you and stuff like that, you know. Um, you, you could, just, like their reserved instance, we say if you're going to be using a VM and you're going to be using it in five years' time, you can actually use a reserved instance and it'll actually save you a lot of money over time. So that's kind of it. Uh, no idea with that and the hybrid part then kind of use you know more in-house stuff that you can use rather than sticking it out on the cloud you know which is it's probably the, the the best um use of resources really the hybrid part um so the calculator there as well is very good for before you actually spin stuff up in the cloud, the cloud like it's kind of going to the pricing calculator, put in all the kind of stuff you need, how much storage, how much VMs or wherever. And it gives you an actual idea before you actually go ahead and do it. So that's, um, that's that one. And there's the service level agreements again that I was telling you like that um, they guarantee it was going to be up. 99.95% or wherever like that. And where, you know, what zones that you're going to put your stuff in, like if you're, we'd say, if you're here in Ireland and you want to back something up, you know, we've got, as far as I know, we've got three zones, one in North Dublin, one South Dublin, and one in West of Dublin. So every time you save something, it's saved in those three locations um so that's kind of a general overview really of the azure fundamentals so
Thanks, Stan and Matthew. Didn't take too long. Thanks a million. Um, thanks a million, Frank. Uh, as as always, you're a valued uh, contributor in this community. Um, Frank will obviously be going up as one of our uh, most valuable contributors on my website, www.focusit.e. Um, Frank, Frank is, uh, he specializes in Azure and has worked in the IT industry for over 20, 25 years. So um, we're really lucky to have him here. And the Azure fundamentals is something that everybody uh, everybody should do it's it's a starting place in microsoft uh with the new role-based exams um myself and frank i'm sure we'll be doing a bit of uh what you call it virtual uh sessions uh showing people how to set up uh azure how to get it up and running you know or back uh nsgs wafs all that kind of good stuff so we we, we plan to do that uh, down the line so thank you very much frank really appreciate it um okay. thank, you for, thank, you. thank you for joining us um okay guys so the next presentation is actually going to be myself i'm giving an overview of the ms 900 um office 365 fundamentals exams so i'm just gonna put that up there so a bit about me, my name is Matthew Brown. I've been in IT for the last 10 years. Uh, I've worked for me large, medium uh, enterprise companies. Um, I specialized in help desk support tier level one, two and three for the first five or six years. And I moved on to cybersecurity. Um, I now work for a company in, in, in Limerick called NTES. Uh, we are an IT uh, specialist company that supports FWAP, um, Azure, Defender, Office 365, all that kind of good stuff. Um, we manage sites from start to finish and we provide 3CX phone systems to our clients. Uh, I'm also a, a MCT, Microsoft Certified Trainer. I'm a Microsoft Certified Educator. I worked my way up to the Azure path to reach the Azure Solutions Architect Expert. I'm also a member of the British Computer Society and the Irish Computer Society. Um, I started my IT career in what was uh, what was back in 2012, and ever since I've I've just loved IT. So without further ado, I will start the presentation. So, MS-900, what is it? It's the 365 Fundamentals exam uh, from Microsoft. It's the equivalent uh, of Azure, but Office 365 element. Um, it focuses a lot on cloud concepts, uh, the compliance, privacy, and trust, and it focuses on pricing naturally because you have all the different Microsoft pricing tiers especially with the recent changes to um, uh, the education side and how Microsoft are pulling partners away from fixed pricing. It's now uh, you, you have to have a yearly contract or else you have to pay more monthly up front. Um, the MS-900 MS uh, consists of many different things. One of, the, one, one of the interesting things is Microsoft Chat and Teams. It goes through the, the use of mobile devices, screen sharing, uh, doing doing calls on Teams, setting up groups. Um, we had Kat Green and a few weeks back who spoke about uh, different apps within Teams. And the 365 Fundamentals exams definitely focuses on Teams. It, it pretty much has its own section. Um, so it's, it's worth checking out and getting used to. Um, chat and collaboration teams discussing how the likes of SharePoints, channels, voice and video calls, remote collaboration, how security and compliance comes into play with Microsoft Teams, the uh, the groups, the um, the the groups, the security groups, the uh, all the different types of channels, 
uh, the policies behind those channels within teams in the admin center stuff that you should be you kind of would be doing on a daily basis in an enterprise organization um so teams goes into about five or six different sections you have the scheduling you have the multi-party the devices the content sharing in teams the live events the transcription the recording and publishing so these are all features you're going to use in teams every day both as a user and an administrator and what the 365 fundamentals exam tries to do is it delves into a bit of each one so that you have the fundamentals of how do i do how do i screen share how do i show content how do i integrate sharepoint within teams and and how does that all link in in the back end for when you're when you're managing the microsoft tenant so with that you also have the you explore the office 365 apps teams excel onedrive powerpoint outlook um word uh this is particularly important in terms of the licensing behind the fundamentals exams understanding how if a user has only um, the likes of an E5 license or an A1 for faculty or an A1 for students. Uh, it goes into that kind of thing. It also goes into the likes of Microsoft Business Premium, which was renamed to Microsoft 365 Business Premium now. And, and Microsoft did that recently. They just changed the naming structure of everything to do with their services. Um, the, what you call it? On my website, I'll have an interactive guide of how to deploy Office 365 Pro Plus in your organization coming up over the next few weeks. I'll be doing a session on it and uh, we'll, we'll go into more depth in that. Um, so Microsoft obviously have made many updates to their uh, their subscriptions. They have the monthly enterprise channel, the semi-annual channel, and all of these uh, kind of worked away in, in terms of when you're creating custom XML files to do deployments on uh, to do deployments on devices and um, quite a lot in it I will definitely be looking at the uh, the Microsoft learn path for that element um, I'm not going to go into detail in everything here because we, we have a short amount of time but OneDrive is touched upon on the 365 fundamentals exams uh, how how to integrate OneDrive on computers, uh, you know, opening up OneDrive, signing in, knowing the difference between uh, always on prem, always in the cloud, knowing when you've accessed documents and whether they're saved locally on your system, that kind of stuff, it goes into that. Um, then we have, yeah, so SharePoint, uh, is touched on as well. You you have to understand how to build SharePoint sites. You have to look at the homepage, the back end side of SharePoint, how you assign permissions uh, to users. Um, how something that I noticed in the tree in the fundamental exam was you may get a question on how to actually uh, pull reports uh, of users that have permissions, that kind of stuff. All really nitty gritty stuff, interesting stuff. Um, I find myself as a, as an administrator for a, a large enterprise that I'm doing this on a daily basis. So this is really good content to get to know, to learn it, to see the back end in a very comfortable environment. All all good stuff to learn. Um, so what the 365 Fundamentals exam also does is it gives you an overview of the management process, the likes of working with forms and workflows. Um, you also have how you can collaborate with others, whether it's on SharePoint, whether it's on Microsoft Teams. Um, you also, from that, you learn the back end of the security part of SharePoint and how that, uh, how that how that integrates with uh, teams. So you you create a team in uh, you sorry you create a Microsoft team in Microsoft Teams. Hence, in the back end, SharePoint has a site for it. 
you can within that site you can drop folders in you can create permissions for that you a lot of users if they have certain rights uh, whether they're a contributor or a read only or a editor depending on what they have they can they can contribute and make changes and um, most of the time as an admin that's going to be restricted on an enterprise environment um so what the 365 exam goes through is quite extensive uh it goes it does go through intune it goes through the likes of setting up uh what you call it setting up profiles uh de device compliance os deployment the difference between white love and uh the white love and automatic uh, enrollment. It also goes through how you should be uploading autopilot IDs. Um, the 365 exam also goes through the Microsoft renamed the Intune Endpoint Management Console, and it's now your hub for everything Intune. Um, you will find that Windows Autopilot over the last few years has really been worked on by Microsoft. A lot of companies are implementing this. So Windows Autopilot is spoken about in the exam. Whether or not it goes into the heap details literally depends on the type of questions you get on the day. Um you, you can get questions about how would you you how would you how might you go about creating a profile in Microsoft Engine? What's the difference between a hybrid deployment and an Azure AD only deployment? Um how do you how do you um how do you install Microsoft Office? Those kind of things. Um, Active Directory is a very much important part of this exam. Act Azure Active Directory kind of ties in with Intune. Uh, users, groups, AD Connect, AD Sync, all that good stuff that you need to understand. The types of authentication from single sign-on to MFA. Uh, it goes through all that. It also goes through the uh, the back end of Intune on how to set up and configure the MAM portals, the uh, the business store for if you want to if you want to deploy apps. So you're going to want to deploy apps in an organization, but you're going to want to do it very easily. So it it might go through how you set up a Microsoft business store, how you set up the groups, how you assign users permissions to the group so that when they open up the company portal um that the apps are either there or else as part of the intune deployment when you're creating your configuration profile the apps will have been installed um as part of the setup um business process automation very much a microsoft thing uh sharepoint power automate power apps uh, if you have ever looked at any of the Power BI stuff, uh, the fundamentals and that, you'll have got a you'll have got an idea of how that works. And um, Aaron Dam showed us pipelines in Azure earlier. It's it's there's a lot of automated stuff. You won't get asked a huge a huge amount of questions on that, but it's it's something they touch on. So just just be wary. Um, work management. It goes into how Microsoft Planner should be used boards, arts, scheduling, 365 groups, all part of Intune, all part of Office 365, all part of Teams, all part of general life with Microsoft products um, in, in the cloud. So uh, the, what I have noticed is Microsoft are keen on going through the likes of the benefits of modern management. It should be easy to deploy. It should always be up to date. You should have, have a proactive approach in building uh, maintaining and deploying it. The intelligence behind the security for Microsoft 365 services are something, uh, something incredible because, I mean, you have advanced threat protection with the business premium one and two licensing. You have all the additional uh, AP and security compliance control. You have secure score. You have all stuff. What, what you'll find is the exam might touch on with the Intune and Endpoint Management so how to integrate a hybrid solution. It, it, it may or may not touch on it, but it, it can, and it's there in the list of uh, the scope of what the exam might have. Um, how to Intune certificates, how to set up iOS profiles, Android profiles, all that kind of stuff. It's all in it. 
and it's really interesting stuff. I mean, who doesn't want to get a computer that says, welcome, Matthew, or welcome, Dan, or welcome, Aaron, Dan. We're setting up your computer. It'll be ready in 10, 15 minutes. And you literally turn it on, you connect it to the internet, and you're welcome straight away. And it goes through the process, and it deploys all the apps in the back end, so that within 15 minutes, you're good to go. Um, you're ready to start your start your new career or your new job, wherever it may be. Your IT department can easily log in through autopilot with the integration of other third party tools like uh, Team Viewer, uh, Quick Assist from built in from Microsoft, all that kind of stuff. Really interesting. Um, and this is just an example of what the Endpoint Admin Center looks like. Um, it is a very interesting topic to get stuck into. I've done a 45 page uh, document on the setting up of Microsoft Intune, which I'll be publishing soon. And all the nitty gritties uh, in Intune, very interesting. I have to say, I, I enjoyed doing it. Um, Intune, my oh my, how has it developed for um, the MS 900? Intune has developed a lot over the years. It started off very basic. It worked its way up to integrating with Azure AD, then on-premise. Then we had the exams like the AZ-800 and 801, where we had a hybrid deployments. It, Intune is where a lot of companies are going because P hybrid work seems to be here to stay. So Intune is something you'll find if you're at the fundamental stage. You'll want to work your way up to the associate level exams and to the expert level exams, and you you'll just genuinely enjoy it. And you know the 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 facilities within Intune make life very easier, easier, especially if you're deploying. Uh, you know you can take group policies from your on premise and import them into Intune with a with a thing called into preview and it lets you tell you if those group policies are suitable for Intune or if you can just scrap them and use built-in policies so that's where Intune's at at the moment it's it's quite extensive there's a lot in it but it's very enjoyable and the fundamentals exam does touch on it a bit and um, it goes through the uh, co-management of Windows 10 devices in Intune this is just a diagram of all the different services and things you can do um, then we also then we also have the autopilot zero touch deployment this is what i was talking about so this is my favorite part i get very excited when i hear a client say we want to be able to send our we want to be able to send our employees out a device first of all this is something that every organization does they do it on a daily basis and often hours are spent setting up these devices. So how do you start it? You set up the Azure tenant through the endpoint management console. You create the deployment profiles. If you're doing a fully automated white glove experience, um, that's that's brilliant because then the, the, the device is assigned to the user before they even get it. So you have your reseller or your OEM like Dell or HP. You order, you purchase the device. The device is delivered to the uh, delivered to the employee. The hardware hashes are received by the OEM provider. They're uploaded to Microsoft Endpoint Management Console. They're then put into if it's a device group like HR management. You put the users in there and you make the assignment. If you're just doing, if you're not doing any special groups and you're just uh, assigning users one by one, which can be a bit more trickier to manage, you can just assign the user. Um, the point being is that when the user is finished with the, uh, when the user is finished with this device as well, you have the ability to reset the device remotely, uh, wipe the data, request it to be sent back to the supplier or the OEM provider. It's all really interesting stuff. Autopilot Zero Touch deployment is where it's at, it's where it's going. And the ability to have the white glove experience with a device is just amazing. Um, so AZ, 
MS900 also touches on feature updates, quality updates, servicing channel deployment rings. So it kind of goes into all the different things you can do with Intune. It's quite interesting. Um, the Microsoft Learn part is quite good for it. So I, I definitely recommend having a look at it. Um, the deployment methods. So as we can see, we've already had five or six slides. Um, hint, hint, nudge, nudge. It does go into Intune. It depends on what you get, maybe. Uh, so Windows Autopilot has an out-of-the-box experience, as I said. Um, you must kind of have, you know, Windows, Windows 7 or 8.1, which are kind of gone at this stage. It's now more Windows 10 or Windows 11. Um, you have to have a minimum version of Windows 10, uh, like 18, 1803 or 1809. Um, the ability to create the provisioning packages is very quick. Um, and the activation of the autopilot uh, feature is very simple. You have to have a Windows 10 Pro or enterprise device with an enterprise license. Uh, they have to have access to a, at the time of this, it was each year E5, there's more than that. You can actually order specific Intune licensing for users and you can assign them on a user per user base or what Office 365 does is you can just get a batch of licensing and as you create each user account, they're assigned to licensing. So it's per user licensing or it can be per device licensing. And um, something the Azure Fundamentals touches on is AVD, Azure Virtual Desktop. Azure Virtual Desktop is something that not quite a lot of people have gone over to just yet. Uh, we have, uh, I work for a company, as I said, called NTS, and we have a few clients over on Azure Virtual Desktop. It's, it's a very simple thing. It's like going back to when we had the RDS set up in, uh, in on-prem infrastructure, where you might have had one remote desktop server that would have been CALS, and users would have accessed this this uh, virtual system uh, with a thin client like a HP or a Dell thin client or a Lenovo. But what AVD does, it takes it to the next step. So Azure Virtual Desktop is in the cloud. It's all configured within Azure. Uh, you can set, you can have it so that the virtual desktops are started up at eight o'clock in the morning on a Monday, and they're shut down at uh, six o'clock Friday evening or shut down six o'clock every evening, depending on what you want. Um, AVD provides an ability to allow uh, loads of users sign into multiple virtual desktops. Um, it balances the load across them all and users get a consistent experience because usually the desktops have, uh, most of the desktops would have the same software or a golden image on them. Azure Virtual Desktop is really the replacement for the RDS uh, servers. Uh, it's the replacement for using on-prem servers, for using virtual RDS servers on-prem. It's kind of your, once you make the move to AVD, you're, you're kind of, you kind of stick with it and that's, that's where it's at. Um, it's a very flexible platform and you can scale up and scale down as you need, depending on the workload. Um, so my analytics is something Microsoft introduced recently. You get a lot of those well-being emails, collaboration product, pro productivity insights. Every day we might get them from Viva Insights to our mailboxes if you're in an enterprise environment. Something quite interesting, it gives you an outlook of how your week went, what you did, where you were most productive. Um, I can't see this coming up much in the fundamentals exams though. Um, the 365 Admin Center is the hub of everything with Office 365. Um, I started off my journey a good few years ago with uh, learning about the 365 Admin Center and how, how it all integrates with your on-prem infrastructure or it can be just 365 itself on its own, no, no on-prem. Um, 365 hosts your, uh, what used to be known as your EAC, your exchange online. And that is where you go into to kind of look at uh, user accounts that have mailboxes, all that kind of stuff that you may have done back in the day when it was on-prem. So 
the MS900 goes into that kind of thing. It goes into the security and compliance side, Microsoft Secure Score, Microsoft Defender for Cloud, goes into all that kind of nitty gritty, and it's it's quite interesting. Um, the 365 Admin Center has all the, is, is like, um, is your one pane or single pane of glass for all your different options where you might want to look at your Teams Admin Center, your OneDrive, your Exchange, your Compliance, your Azure. It's all in there. And this is the hub of Microsoft's, um, uh, what you call it, platform as a service offering this this is where you have if you sign up to a business standard or an e3 or an e5 uh office 365 account this this is what you'll have as an organization most people started off as a trial and then they get involved with uh your you know you have the likes of micro warehouse you have vision vision um you have other resellers that might do um that might do integration with Office 365 and cloud offerings. So this, look, this is where you start and that's what the service admin, that's what the service admin center is. So Microsoft 365 capabilities are pretty much endless. It has everything, everything from your basic emails to your OneDrive, to your, uh, to your exchange. It's a simplified process of looking at everything under the one pane of glass. It's your alternative to if you might want to go fully um, online with everything rather than having a hybrid environment. But it's also, it's adaptable in terms of this works in a hybrid environment. So you can have your local AD server with your Azure Active Directory Connect installed, syncing up to the cloud. You have all your security groups from on-prem up there. The AZ 800 and 801 exams goes into all of that, but uh, just the MS the MS 900 kind of touches on a few bits just to see if you know what they are and have you heard of them. Um, so really important things to know: the 365 for enterprise, business, education, and home. <coughs> They're separate subscriptions, so. In an enterprise environment, you might have an E3, an E5, an F3, formerly F1. In education, you'll have 365 for business. They'll, they'll have three basic plans, a standard and a premium. For education, a lot of that's handled through the um, through volume licensing, which is now being changed up again. They're, they're getting rid of it. Um, so education licensing is free or heavily discounted, depending on the organization. And then, of course, you can have uh, Microsoft 365 Home, but uh, most people that are in uh, schools or colleges are entitled to a free version of Microsoft Office if uh, if your school or college is a Microsoft partner. Um, billing is looked at in the admin center. It's on the left-hand side under purchase services. You look at that for all your invoices and stuff. If it's been handled by your CSV um, or your par IT partner, you may not see this and it's, it's usually uh, direct with them. So the you have all the different SLA service level agreements as Frank spoke about earlier. Um, it kind of defines the instant, the downtime, the claim and the service credit. So Microsoft guarantees a certain uh, SLA and if they don't meet that, they you you are guaranteed to get service credit, assuming they don't meet it, and you can log your case with them, and they'll usually deal with it. Um, so the roadmap portal portal to learn, uh, three six five. Um, there's a lot of stuff in development with Microsoft over the last few years, and they've kind of started integrating RSS feeds for Azure Active Directory. Um, upload CSV files for the likes of bulk user account creation, um, autopilot device upload, CSV again, uh, groups, CSV, uh, security groups, you can do it through CSV as well, or you can do it uh, with the AD Connect, sync them from your on-prem, and uh, that works as well. So the hybrid model, the idea behind the MS900 hybrid model is that you have online, on-prem, so it's a mixture of both. You have your Active Directory Connect server in one place. You have your uh, Office 365 online. 
the connector is installed, you sync the organizational units that you want to sync. Um, it depends, some people have their Active Directory structured in certain ways, so you might have your base contoso.com domain, and then you might have within it, you might have the users group, the OU group, um, uh, you might have the devices group and all that. And that's, that's, that's what a hybrid model is. It kind of goes in between both. Um, so you kind of realistically, as Frank said earlier, the it's cost savings, it's reliability and compliance and it's functionality. Depending on what you want to do, you're either going to go with a hybrid, a cloud, or just an on-prem, one of the three. It depends on what management are looking for. It depends on what the client wants. It depends on what the real life scenario says. Um, you also have additional considerations. Um, when you're choosing this, you might look at the investment, uh, buying hardware over a few years versus uh, a continuous payment with Microsoft. Um, you have to look at the likes of how quick hardware gets outdated. Uh, you might have limited in-house IT resources, meaning you don't have the professionals maybe in your organization to maintain an environment or the, the person on site might only specialize in certain roles, aka Microsoft role-based certification, and you might want to offload this to your cloud your uh, cloud provider. And also it depends on the capital you have as an organization. Um, migration from Office Trees from uh, Active Directory to Office 365 is another beast in in comparison. Uh, there's a lot of uh, understanding how AD works, how Office 365 works, immutable IDs, all that kind of stuff. It's it's a minefield. There's a bit of work in looking at that. I would definitely suggest to check out John Savile's MS900 video on that. Some excellent stuff. Um, Microsoft has brought in the zero trust methodology. This has come up quite a lot in the last two years. Um, you will find that there's events on in Ireland and the UK for and Europe and the US that go through zero trust quite a lot. Microsoft hosts a lot of online events for this. Very interesting stuff. Something you need to know for the exam. Uh, defense in depth is a uh, it goes through the layered approach in the MS nine hundred data application compute network perimeter identity access physical stuff you will probably know from back when you did your A plus network plus or security plus certifications with Comte if you did those or your um or your CISP or any of that kind of stuff um the CIA triad, triad confidential confidentiality, integrity, availability. This is something that uh, us IT people live by in terms of this is a way to think about security, understanding the balance and how to, and how to get that right in a day-to-day -day organization. Um, the shared responsibility model kind of looks at the difference between uh, software as a solution, platform as a solution, infrastructure as a solution and on-prem. We can see here that you have all the different uh, things you've hosts, you've data centers, you've operating systems. Uh, where the where the where the responsibility lies, whether it's the client, Microsoft, or the hardware manufacturer, all that kind of stuff, shared responsibility model. Um, it does the MS nine hundred touches on the likes of data breaches, dictionary attacks, ransomware, and disrupt disruptive attacks. Um, all really interesting stuff. It can be found in the security and compliance section. Uh, again, John Savile does some fantastic videos on this. Um, he's he's reached over 125,000 subscribers, so some really good stuff. Um, encryption is covered in the MS900 exam quite a lot. Understanding the uh, encryption keys, understanding the uh you know the public versus private um all that kind of stuff it goes into detail if you've ever done csr requests or certificate signing you'll understand that working with the likes of godaddy or key trust or irish domains or any of those you'll you'll, you'll have some bit of knowledge on that if not um 
there's many people online like Thomas Morara um, and others that go into encryption in depth. Once, once again, Mike Chappell does a lot of this in his, uh, in his books and his videos. Professor Messer is another great, um, it's another great person to look at. Um, in terms of encryption, though, if you really want to get bang for your buck, um, I'd be looking at Udemy and Jason Dion. He is quite a good and well-known uh, teacher in the United States, and he focuses. He looks at he looks at the hashing, he looks at the cloud adoption framework, all that kind of stuff. Um, as Frank said earlier, you're going to want to have a strategy. You're going to want to plan it. You're going to want to have your checklist, your your adoption, your migration, how you're going to innovate once you're over to the cloud, all that kind of stuff. Um, identities comes up, especially with uh, conditional access policies. You're going to have that in the MS900 because you're going to want to stop attackers from getting into Office 365 accounts. You you know, you, you can't afford a data breach on your global admin account or your break glass account or your um your on-premise accounts so microsoft goes into detail in that conditional access uh policies understanding how they work reviewing them it's all part of ad it's all part of uh, active directory and the um the conditional access within the security compliance center or within azure it's it's there for um you might look at named locations and stuff um Discovering identity and important information across your environment, something we should all be doing on a daily basis. You'll probably be doing this if you're looking at logs and files uh, for the Azure audit and sign-ins. Um, often people talk about protecting the, uh, protecting the devices in an organization, your BYOD policy, your data loss prevention policy. You're going to have a data loss prevention policy because, I mean, you don't want some morning to wake up to find out that you're after getting hit with ransomware and you have no site to go to. So you might have a cold site or a hot site or a warm site, or even you might have you might have your Azure backups going over to the uh, West Europe or North Europe, depending on where you are. You know, most of those things you're going to have um, it's going to be part of your set of IT security policies. So uh, check check that out. IT security policies, data breach policies. It's all it's all ahead of you. It's all stuff you're going to be doing and looking at on a daily basis. Um, the MS nine hundred does go into the compliance requirements, um, access rights, uh, deny rights, name locations, conditional access. Uh, regularly compliance, especially for GDPR, um, Microsoft has a secure score there, so you can go into that and see what your recommendations are. Remember, not everything Microsoft has in there is what might suit your organization. So be very careful in terms to read the read the policies and understand them. Um, 365 Compliance Center, as I said, it's in there. Uh, the compliance manager with the secure score, we have that there, the types of assessments, templates, how you can improve it, all that kind of good stuff. Here's an example of what your, your secure score might look like. You'll have mandatory and discretionary uh, reports available to you after you run that, and it'll tell you where you need to work on. Um, Insider risk is something the MS900 focuses on. Again, it's all security and compliance. Uh, it goes into all the different bits and pieces you need in that. Um, restrict communications and information barriers. You need to understand how legal, government, financial, HR, all that kind of builds into it. Um, increase control with customer lockbox. It's used for if you're, um, if you're trying to properly hand over documents and files in a secure manner. Um, you might request something from customer it needs to be encrypted. It can go into this very secure, worthwhile looking at. Um, so thank you. That's my presentation on the MS900. Um, I look forward to kind of building uh, more of a, uh, more of a, what you call it, I suppose, a virtual session with people over the next few weeks. And uh, thank you. Thank you.
Um, Very good, Matt. So, so thanks, thanks everyone. Uh, for thank you, thank you, Matt. <laughs> thanks for giving know, information, Matthew. I know, I know, it was quite a long one. So, look, uh, thanks for sticking with me. Um, do we still have Solomon? We do have Solomon. Solomon, I'm not going to delay. Um, you are our final speaker of the night, and once Solomon's finished, we'll have a we'll have a small bit of Q and A. Um, so, Solomon, the floor is yours. I'm going to hand it over to you for the next twenty minutes. Okay. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. I'll try to make my Thank presentation you very short. Much. Yeah. Okay, I'll be sharing my slide now. Okay, just hold on. Okay, my name is Solomon Jeremiah. Um, I'm a Microsoft Certified Trainer and I also have other certifications. And one of the certifications I have include the Enterprise Admin Expert. So today I would be talking about the self-service password reset and password right back in hybrid environment. I would also try to um, make it um, simple and fast also. So the question here is what is the Azure Active Directory authentication? And for my explanation here, which is one of the main features of an identity platform is to verify or authenticate credentials when a user signs in to a device, application, or service. In Azure Active Directory, authentication involves more than just the verification of username and password. So while I'll be going through my screen, I don't really do a demo. I'll just try to use the Azure portal to um, to explain better what I'm trying to say. So I will just share my screen quickly. Let me try to bring up my screen. I've already tried to set up everything. So let me just use my screen to be explaining why I'm also sharing this slide. So I don't know if you can see my screen now. I can see only the uh, the slide, Solomon. Okay, I am trying to. Okay, my, I'm actually share my screen, but I don't know why it's not coming up. Okay, let me stop sharing. Okay, I don't know why my screen is not coming up, but I'm actually sharing my screen now. Okay, can you see the screen now? No, I still see the Azure Active Directory authentication uh, page. It's stuck, I think, there. Oh. Okay, over here, I can see the screen by the left side. Okay, so I will just um, keep presenting with the slide I have. So, but I wanted to actually use my screen to explain better. So I don't know, Dan, can you help me with that? Can you see the screen from your side? Hello, Dan. Okay, I think Dan is not there. Maybe it would have helped me. So um, what is Azure Active Directory Authentication? I already explained that. So the next thing I'll be talking about is um, to improve security and reduce the need for help desk assistance. Azure AD authentication includes the following components. So the idea behind the um, self-service password reset is to try to reduce the workload on your IT help desk. And a lot of organizations, they have Okay, I think my screen is up now. Okay, they have a mixture of both on-premises um, on and cloud applications, and users need to sign in to access these applications. But now when we are talking about the 
um, self-service password reset. If you have users that are on cloud, and then we have sync users, when you try to set this up in your Azure Active Directory, the users you have in your on-prem, their password, when you do the reset, it doesn't actually um, sync to, it doesn't sync back to the Azure Active Directory because when we are talking about on-prem and cloud identity, we have users that are created on-prem and these users that are created on-prem, they sync from on-prem to cloud and once a user is synced to cloud, you cannot um, delete the users from cloud. So when we are also doing the um, self-service password reset, you need to, for, to allow that to happen, there are some procedures which you need to follow. And when you follow these procedures, it would um, enable you to allow users to change their password and when they change their password, they reset their password themselves, you would be able to, the password will be able to reflect on your on-prem environment. So I will just um, go through the slide again before I come here. So from the slide here where I was talking about the, um, I was talking about the, let me just go there. Can I switch over to my screen back? Okay, I was talking about the, um, to improve security and reduce the need for the help decks, the can I switch back to my slide? I think okay, yes. To to improve the security, so I was talking about the self-service password reset, the Azure ID um, multi-factor authentication, the hybrid uh, integration to write password changes back to on-prem, which I would be explaining today, then hybrid integration to enforce password protection policies for on-prem, on-premises environment and password, um, password, um, passwordless authentication. So the next thing here is a um, self-service, self-service password reset, which is, I define there as, and the self-service password reset gives user the ability to change or reset their password with no administrator or help desk involvement. If user's account is locked, that's, um, you know, we have users that um, they have their, um, their account created from on-prem and then they have domain join devices and they use that their account to log into those devices and most times they, those users can also get locked out of those devices. So instead of um, reaching out to your IT help desk or administrator, the user can actually um, do that when we have the self-service password reset set up for the Azure Active Directory and also the um, um, Azure Active Directory. So, that's the basic stuff I'm trying to explain here. And also, we also have the self-service password reset works in the following scenario. So we have that the way we can use this. And one of the way is the password change. We have the password reset and the um, account lock. So if a user wants to change their password, they can actually use this feature in the Azure Active Directory to change their password. And also if a user wants to reset their password, they can also um, use this um, feature that is in their Azure Active Directory to reset their password. We also have um, the account unlock, which I explained earlier when they try to log into their device and their device is locked, they can actually unlock their device on their own without the um, need for them to contact the IT help desk. So I also wrote um, when a user updates or resets their password using self-service password resets, that password can be written back to an on-prem active directory environment. So password writes back makes make sure that a user can immediately use their updated credential with on-prem 
on-premises devices and application. So basically, if a user wants to reset their password, and maybe that user was, if, or if that user is created on-prem, and they want to reset their password, and after they reset their password, they also need to use it to access other applications and log into maybe their devices. What would make that work will be the uh, um, the password write back. So for the password write back, um, can I just uh, go back to my screen, please? Can you help me um, switch the? Yes. Okay. So for the password write back, I just I will just try to um, make it fast because I also um, created a uh, a server on prem, so I can just explain how everything works. So when you're in your Active Directory and then you're trying to set up your self service password reset. We have options here where you can actually choose to select it all for all users. And one of the prerequisites that you would need before you can do this, you would need the Azure um, Premium P1 or P2 license to set this up. And you can choose to select all the users in your tenant. You can also choose to um, create a group and put some selected users you want them to have this feature on their account so you can select a group you can select all and after you've done that we have the um, authentication method so what happens in this authentication method you can choose um, the different ways that you want the users to um, use what they would always um, refer to when they are trying to probably um, reset their password. So they can always set that up at first. And after they set that up, then anytime they want to probably reset their password, they would always um, provide this information that they set up at first. So now we have different options that you can choose from. So from this my tenants, I chose the email, the office phone, and security questions. So if you're choosing the security questions, you can choose the number of questions that are required to the, that the user needs to register, and you can also the number of questions the user needs to provide when they want to reset their questions. And those questions can be selected. You can choose to select different questions that you want the users to pick from anytime they are trying to set up these services. So when you're done selecting this, the next thing um, you see here is require users to register when signing in. So what this does is you can choose why after setting this up, if a user is trying to sign in after you've done this whole setup, the user will be prompted to fill in these information. Like the user will have to register with this information after they try to sign in when this whole uh, um, process has been implemented. So we also have the numbers of days before the users is being um, asked for the information they provided that they should try to reconfirm information that were provided. Then we have notifications where you also notify users after they have, um, when, they, when they reset their password, you can notify the users. We also have, um, where you can also notify admins when an admin resets another pass their password. So we also have the notifications here. Then we have customizations. So most times this customization where you see customize help desk link, you can actually have like maybe a site where you try to explain the procedures for users. And then you can always put the link here. Maybe if a user is try having issues trying to set up their, um, their uh, password resets, who can put a link here where they can just go through the link and follow the process. Or you can also create, like, put your help desk ticket link where they can always contact the help desk um, for um, guidance while setting this up. So this particular place is um, what um, we need to also focus on when we are talking about the um, password right back. So here is where we set up the password right back so that users that we sync from on-prem to the cloud, they can actually um, 
Kodo this process. Now, if you don't turn on this, if you have synced users, there will be issues with the um, when it comes to password reset. So what this does, it tries to um, create a process where when a user that was synced from the on-prem is resetting their password, the password can actually sync back to the on-prem in real time. So this is not like the like the normal sync we all know where um, password um, syncs after two minutes. But when we are talking about this, it will sync in real time. But then doing this alone is not just enough because after you do this and you did not configure this on your server side where you have your um, AD Connect tool, this um, won't be working. So you have to come here. So I already um, set up my my um, Active Directory here. And this is a, a user I created, a test user. I already created the test user, so I don't spend a lot of time. So this is the test user that was created on-prem. And this user have already synced the um, user to cloud. And after syncing the user to cloud, I I tried to log in with the user, which I did here. But then when I tried changing the password, I was just doing like a demo, but I didn't really want to um, waste time. You'll see you have issues with that. But when you come to the connect, um, Azure AD Connect tools, and you open it, when you open this, this should come up. Then when this should come up, I would, okay, now this is up. You would configure this. And when you're configuring this, you have to, customize your synchronization. So I will just try to run this very fast so I can get there. So I'm going to put my password. So now this is the um, my global admin for my tenant. So I will just put my password real quick so we can get to the part where the whole password right back be set. So this is loading. So when this is done, I'm just going to click on next. And then when we go to the optional features. So if you look at this now, I ticked the password right back. So if this is not ticked, you won't be able to use the feature of the password right back. So what this does, it helps to synchronize the password in real time. And it does not just synchronize the password, it also helps when you have and password policies that we already set for within your on-prem environment. If you have password policies, these password policies will be implemented on those sync users when they are trying to um, reset their password. Once you are done um, ticking the password right back, you can just click on next and click on next. The whole synchronization process is going to take place. And once you're done, with that, um, let me just check real time if, okay, then once you're done with that, there's this two link you need to use. So one of the link is for setting up your password. So once you're done, I already did that for this user. So if you go to this link, which is the, um, the aka.ms forward slash SSPRO, so the user will have the ability set up the their authentication method which i already added for this user they would add the user would add their alternative emails add they would also answer their security questions and all of that so after the user have finished doing that anytime this user wants to reset their password they can always come back to use the other link which is this link i'm going to be posting um pasting here which is the aka.ms slash SSPRO. So this is not like the setup this for the password reset. So once the user comes to this particular part, they can always put in their email. And once they put in their email, so let me just try to um, run this user email real quick. Okay, on-prem. Let me just run this user email real quick on this. Then I'm going to write this out. So 
once I click next now, I hope I got it right. Okay. Uh, let me just confirm the email, please. Okay. So um, I'm just going to wait for the next. Okay, so now this is the next page where this is going to be taking me to. So once the user is planning to reset their password, you can see the user now have the option where they can reset their password. And if you can see the next one is, um, I know my password, but still can't log in. So this particular um, scenario here is for users that are probably locked out of their devices and they need to unlock their account. So if you want to unlock your account, you can use this. But if you forget your account, you can, the user can always use this. And then once the user clicks on next, you can see that I already registered this external um, alternative email address. So once I click on mail, they would, I will get a code which I would use to reset this password. I can also choose to provide the answers to my security questions that I was asked. And once I do that also, I would have access to um, resetting the password. And if I'm also using the other method, which is um, for locked accounts, I can always use that to get back into my, um, I can use that to get back into my device. So with this um, process that I just explained, when organizations that have um, the on-prem environment and also they also have cloud users and all of that, the, the idea of sending a lot of tickets for the help desk or contacting the administrator when a user needs to um, change their password or reset their password or they are being locked out it is reduced and the workflow would be of tickets coming into the it help desk would be reduced in this particular aspect and when we also have our on-prem environment you can see with the password um, right back feature you can actually allow your synced users reset their password and that was the password will be synced back to the on-prem in real time and apart from the password being synced back on-prem in, in real time the policies that we already set the password policies that were set up in the on-prem env em em environment would also be implemented um, i think for now this is um, all i will be saying regarding this and also i would like to say thank you for your time and thank you matthew and dan for your time so uh, thanks so much i this is all i have to say for tonight so i don't waste a lot of time um amazing solomon thank you so much i'm so sorry uh where we've been short on time this evening guys um what you call it some fantastic some fantastic speakers, um, some interesting content from, from Azure DevOps all the way over to Microsoft Azure AD Connect, all the way over to Office 365 and Intune. Some really good, uh, some really good topics. Um, <coughs> what you call it, um, has anybody got any questions? Any Anything that we kind of want to ask each other or anything? No, no, we are, we are showing that, that was a great demo. Where yeah. did you, uh, are Thank those you uh, your time. own? Are those your own virtual machines or are those like uh, classroom virtual machines? Uh, How do you use those? I, I actually use them to train people. So I just, create, this one, I just created this today because of the um, event. So I just had to set this up real quick. So that was perfect. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, Salman, tell, tell us uh, where, um, what is your area in terms of uh, 
certification and training, what what is it you specialize in? So my area of specialization, I am more into, um, I would say I started the whole cloud with Exchange online admin, admin. So, but then I started moving into more of security and compliance where I help organizations to create DLP policies, um, sensitive information. I also do simulation attacks and all of that. So, but then I also do other stuff apart from the exchange online. I also handle teams, SharePoint okay. sites. Yeah. So, and I also <coughs> handle the Azure Active Directories. I set up the servers also for organizations. Do um I suppose would you have looked at the what you call it now the beta exam for exchange salmon? Uh, that just that that's currently in beta. Did you were you lucky enough to get to give it a shot? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, can, yeah. I can I can I can do that, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, no I, um it's amazing how you started out an exchange, Jeannie. Um does anyone remember having to mount databases, no? fixing them no uh, i know solomon doesn't miss because <laughs> his, his face just lit up <laughs> um what you call it um Ar Arndam, tell us a bit about your specialization i know it's dev <coughs> i know it's devops um just just give us give us um give us a five minute kind of intro is as to what it is you do on a daily basis for people that may not have um have ever looked at DevOps, you know? Uh, I think he's muted, is he? Yeah, we're still... Yes, I'm on mute, sorry. No, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we can, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's always a classical thing, you know, even uh, during the meetings, you know, I start talking in the Teams and then I realize <laughs> yeah, I'm mute. Okay, so um, I'm, I'm basically, I started as an Azure engineer. Uh, I, I started with Azure assessment. So when I say that assessment, it, it means that, you know, you are assessing the data center workloads and then you are together with the uh, application owners, then you feel that, okay, what can be migrated as, as a part of lift and shift. So that is how I started. And then after assessment, I moved in, as an Azure engineer uh, in sense, like, you know, building a prototype um that okay if if a service i mean like if an application needs you know services how to deploy it and those kind of things building a prototype in, in azure uh which fits what application and then slowly once the prototype is built then i slowly moved into the devops part or the infrastructure as a code part which i started uh, initially with the uh, parcel then I moved into Terraform, then I moved into Terraform PowerShell together, and now I'm working with Azure Biceps. And then now I have elevated my position as an architect. So I am an Azure lead and, and, and like an Azure architect and a DevOps architect. So my role is more into architecture, build, run, and automation. So that is how, in a nutshell, is, is my profile and my day-to-day -day work. Did you um did you take the Azure expert exam yet, or are you in progress kind of with it? So uh, to to me it's uh, Dan uh, for me I, I like to give the certification when I have a little bit of hands on in, in most okay. of the areas. Uh, I didn't give the exam ex architect examination only for one reason is because I still have the services you know the messaging services the event grid. Mm -hmm service bus i still don't have a real-time exposure so i have yes that is the only reason that i have hold it because i know myself that as soon as i give that examination i will never touch the services this is this is me. yeah i i think i think um i think and um, i think you would pass this or expert exam with frank colors genuinely with the level of what i saw on the thing today I think Solomon, you would as well if you haven't already done it. Um, I think all. Five I've done it was, already. Oh, you've done it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah, it just it look. I mean, all five of us here um, are very capable engineers and IT architects. I think people are afraid of that as your exam. I don't. I don't know why, but I think Microsoft have. I suppose. They, they have said for a lot of people it is 
quite a heavy exam to, to undertake. Um, I remember when the I was lucky enough, I didn't have to take the ones Frank and Dan had to take. I had the AZ305. I took that when it was in beta, and uh, obviously I passed it. Like, but um, I was surprised to see how far I had passed it. As in, it was a good score. It was a decent score. But Microsoft, I know people that said to me that they took the exam and like their their questions were fairly full on. Like some of the labs they got and it was tough. But I don't think taking um I don't think taking a certification exam actually defines you really. It just means look, you've you've gone off and you've done the paper. But people like Salman, like yourself, where you're doing all the demos and showing people how to actually use the infrastructure. That's the kind of person I'd like to be learning off. And it's the same with you, Aaron Dan, because um, we, that's something Microsoft, uh, I, I think they're short of practical MCTs. Um, like Dan does a lot of, uh, he, you, you work as an MCT as well, Dan. Um, and, you know, there's a, there's a great thing reading off a presentation and, you know, saying your piece and that's grand, but actually showing someone how to do it is another level. And the the level of expertise here tonight was quite good, I have to say. That's just that's just my thinking and my viewpoint on it. Um, it's not easy to get up and give presentations on Azure AD Connect, uh, password right back, um, what you call it, DevOps um, pools, the going through the flow of the of the code and all that. Sorry, the pipeline. Um, you know some great stuff. And Frank, of course, going through all the fundamentals in Azure for anybody that hasn't done it. Um, I think my I think the MS nine hundred is another fantastic exam. Um, some great stuff tonight, guys. Um, Salman, I meant to say as well, obviously, you're going to be added to the uh, most valuable uh, contributors on the Focus IT website. Um, I'm hoping that this would be our group, kind of no matter what, over the next few months, where we had me, we had Dan, with Frank, with Salman, with Aaron Dam. I think if we had this group alone, we'll be able to give all the people out there that really don't know what they want to get into in Azure or DevOps or uh, Office 365 or Teams, you know, really everybody here that uh, that we can give people a flavor of all the different elements while showing them something practical, while having a conversation about the exams, not being afraid to say things that others might not say because, you know, um, you there's politics and all that with what you say. Um, Dan, and I started this off uh, with a dream, wasn't it, Dan? It was a dream we had one night I was over in the UK. You're, you're muted, Dan. <laughs> same same uh, thing, you know, like you yeah, start talking and then it tells you you're muted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it started with just the two of us and we're up to, you know, six to nine typically on these yeah. these panels, which is great. This, this started off, I was in London at the time, and myself and Dan just met over LinkedIn. Um, that's where it started. And I'm hoping myself and Dan will meet each other in person in June now. So that, yes. that is You guys bad. haven't met, met yet uh, in person? No. no really? Not. Nice. No. Okay, this is... This is this is the this is the whole DevOps culture, you know, you are in two different locations. Are you working together, contributing, and then you know you haven't met, and you know, this is this is cool. Yeah, and I'm um, probably I'm, over in uh, Dublin, so yeah, yeah. Be fun to so I'm I'm, I'm over in Ireland. Dan, you're over in where are you again? It's Chicago suburb. Chicago, Mid that's it. Midwest. Frank Frank is uh, about half an hour up the road from me. Frank Falvey. Um, Salman, where are you based? I'm in Nigeria. Nigeria, my God, I'd be a long time traveling there. Um, uh, Aradam, where are you based? Um, I'm from Switzerland. 
Switzerland. Okay, question. If I open a Swiss bank account tonight, can I, can I get money over there? <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. That's, that's a notion, you know, Matthew, this is a notion that there's no concept called Swiss bank. I there's know, no I, I, all no. those, all those, those films give Switzerland a bad rap. Yeah. I don't care what anyone says. Um, <laughs> Switzerland, whoa, Switzerland, Nigeria, Chicago, Cork, Limerick, um, Raquel is in the background saying nothing, um, doing an amazing uh, job. Oh, also Chicago. <laughs> Chicago, you are doing an amazing job tonight, missus. Thank you so much for coming on and giving us a hand. Oh, I'm just trying to learn so I can be better for next time. <laughs> oh no, you're 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 you, you. I've I found myself kind of stepping back tonight now and letting yourself. And then I started realizing that you were working together on seeing all the animations. Great stuff, um, guys. This has been such a good event. Um, I am going to be. We won't be on next week because I'm actually going on. I'm on annual leave finally in five months um so i'm taking a week off but we will have the following week i'll have i'll have it arranged that we do an event um is anyone feeling anything in particular for the next event from the different areas uh Solomon, what would you like to do for the next event hmm. uh, i think i'll just think about it maybe something in exchange okay yeah okay. I'd love, I'd love to see that. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Exchange is something that we're going to be using still. So, yeah. So it's I'll... just exchange online now. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> for, we're fine. They're trying to phase out the other it, it has a lot in it, right? So if you, yeah. if you talk about the exchange, there are a lot of other stores that are built into exchange so i de and i definitely didn't pass that exam i'm nearly sure of it <laughs> I'll, I'll send you my score when i get the result i definitely <laughs> failed the exchange exam um uh Aaron Dam, what would you like to talk about on the next one uh i would i would love to talk about uh, there are a couple of topics um, i have in mind um okay. it's, it's like you know whenever people people think you know when i started uh, devops i was uh, like you know not very comfortable i just want to uh, present something you know which which can make people you know not hesitant enough that it's devops is not like you know, a big giant uh, monster or something that you have to be afraid of it's yeah. it's very simple to start with something so maybe you know devops and terraform together uh, something together uh, a little bit of architecture and those kind of things that would that would be amazing frank what are you going to do for us the next day what would you like to do bearing in mind that we're running out of talking about fundamental exams <laughs> unless you're going to do power bi <laughs> yeah, i've done a bit of machine learning okay ai uh, ai ai 900 no 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 i or no. don't um is Azure Machine Learning, you know, okay. they've got a kind of graphical uh, drag and drop. Have anybody ever seen it? I've I've seen, it. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen some of it, all right, yeah. Yeah, you it, you know, there's one part that's, um, you, you have to do all the coding and everything else to yeah. crunch the data. But this one is actually Microsoft's gives you this uh, cheat sheet with all the, like we say, if you were doing, we'd say something that's got two things in it, it's got a yes or a no. Like we say, if you got a data set no, and you wanted to figure out whether there was fraud in the data set or there wasn't fraud in it. So it'll give you two. So it's a, it would be two classes, basically. You use a two class algorithm so basically you want to know whether there is fraud or does not so you use that one and you just pull okay. that actually into you have a grid and you touch up all the different things you know? <coughs> okay perfect maybe um, something like that or else maybe something like an iot okay Internet yeah. of things um there's microsoft has um they have this um prototype on github that you can actually go into 
going through your Azure subscription, set up an IoT hub, and okay. then go out and copy your code, go over to GitHub, and you just paste it in there, and two can sync up nicely, you know? Okay. All right. Maybe something Sounds like that. Good. Maybe Dan, you, Dan, you have got away from, you, you've, you've, Given, been given a wide berth in terms of your managing the last two events <laughs> for me while I was off skiving. No, I was actually sick, honestly. Um, four four days in bed will do it to you. And um, what are you what are you going to do for us the next day? Because we're obviously so. I I'm hoping our presenters will be Aaron, Dan, Solomon, Frank, and Dan for the next. Yeah, event. yeah. Um, I can so talk about Microsoft. I can talk about Microsoft 365 groups and how they work Perfect. with uh, Microsoft Teams and SharePoint and many other Microsoft technologies. So I'll put that together for uh, the 27th. And I know that Saturday I am doing a pickleball tournament. So as long as oh, there are any, uh, any other things going on. <laughs> we will, we, we will look, we'll, we'll do confirmation with everyone because you know, we, we all have lives as well, but exactly. we generally try to keep it every two weeks for mm. those of you who are watching. Um, okay. So Dan, uh, Frank, Solomon and Aaron, Dan, one last question. So for Dan, you missed our let's talk certification, uh, or did you, I can't remember. Were you there last night? Yeah. You were, but you, you missed the end. I think mm -hmm. um, we didn't get you. So what's your favorite CompTIA yeah. certification? I I don't have If any. you were to do one, if you were to do <laughs> if one. If I were to do one, it would probably be the Security Plus at this point. Yeah. No, Solomon is happy. <laughs> <laughs> Solomon is really, really happy. He got, actually Solomon got three votes, you know, himself and was uh, another colleague, I think, you know, but I, I don't remember his name, Matt. Uh, who else yeah. was? Yeah, what was what was your Solomon last night? Security Plus also. Security Plus. And yeah. Frank, what what was yours last night? Linux Plus. Linux. And Aradam, yours? It was Network Plus. Network Plus and mine was Siza. Um Raquel, if you were to pick one, um if you were to decide to dive into it, what would you what would you be interested in? in a cloud topic um yeah so like what company certification would you do if you want if you had one to choose i honestly have no idea um i am the least knowledgeable on this uh even though my dad's a microsoft mvp i just listened to him talk about azure and i think that sounds cool because the name is azure but okay. as far as yeah. i know there seems like a lot of possibilities with all this stuff and i respect it completely so 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 guys i'm, I'm going to say raquel's a cloud plus kind of gal and uh, <laughs> that's what she that's what she might like in comp cloud plus or cloud essentials and um, re it's a really good exam raquel you you'd actually it's it's a fun, energetic, um, interesting exam. You you'd love it. Um, I am so happy to have you here, Raquel. It has just been so helpful. Um, I do hope you'll join us on more events, uh, helping, and eventually maybe you might turn on the camera and say hello to everyone. Um, for all the hard work that you were doing tonight, to be fair to you. Um, so we we all really appreciate it, honestly. Well, thank, thank you so, so much. much for giving me this opportunity. I really want to help out as much as I can because I think all this information is very useful. Thank, thank you, Erica. Thank you. Um, Dan, can you see us out like you did earlier there? Um, thanks a million to Dan, Solomon, Frank, and Aaron Dam and Raquel uh, in the background for all the help. Guys, wishing you a good weekend. Bye. Yeah, bye. Bye. Thanks all. Bye. Yeah.